Well, hello everyone. We're going to talk about exceptions. Everything that you need to know about exceptions. Throwing and catching. Some people call it handling. What exceptions are. All about exceptions in this one. So an exception. Uh, a Java program, we don't say that it crashes. We say that it throws an exception. Or an exception is thrown. This is something that happens at runtime during the execution of a specific line of code. So I, I want you to start off by thinking of an exception as an object. It's like a ball that's physically thrown. So this object, its job is to carry some information about what went wrong. So something goes wrong at runtime. The flow of control is interrupted. We cannot continuing, continue executing the program because an exception has been thrown. And then what happens when the flow of control is interrupted is what we have to understand um, about the behavior of the program after an exception occurs. So I want to um, go into the development environment and just start um, doing something very simple that would say give you an idea of what's going on here. So if we have um, a gets b divided by 0, a divide by 0 in integer, what's going to happen? when we run this program. OK, an exception has occurred. And we find out down here what's happened. What kind of an exception has occurred when we tried to actually execute this divide at runtime? Well, it was an arithmetic exception. And inside that arithmetic exception, there's a message that says divide by zero. And it tells us what line of code this happened on. It happened on um, line nine of this program, this class called Hello Exceptions. And the program did not continue from this division. It's the flow of control was interrupted, the variable a did not get a new value. So right at that point, the flow of control was interrupted. An object of this type was created, Java Lang arithmetic exception. So that's the thing that I want you to think of as the ball that gets thrown. So it was the JVM that made this object. The virtual machine made an instance of the class arithmetic exception. It put inside that object a message describing what happened. What went wrong was there was a divide by zero. And that's the message inside of this object. And that object was thrown. OK, let's talk about the objects that can be thrown. This is um, Here's an inheritance hierarchy, and this is um, these ones in red. You really have to know them. These are the the inheritance hierarchy structure that is used to create exception objects. So these are classes, and this is the inheritance hierarchy of these classes. Something that is a throwable is an object that can be thrown. That seems to make sense. There are only two things that are throwable. An exception is throwable, and an error is throwable. So in the Java SDK, there's a whole bunch of these classes already defined for us. And under the error branch of this hierarchy, there are some very serious things that can happen at runtime. And the programmer is not expected to handle these. In fact, it's very bad practice to try to handle these. Uh, although you could, the same mechanism for catching exceptions could be used for catching errors, but you as the programmer are expected not to do that. 
So under exception, let's look at that side of the hierarchy, there's a special branch called runtime exception. And anything that is a runtime exception is something that might happen in any method. So any method might throw a runtime exception. One of the things that is a runtime exception is the one we just looked at, arithmetic exception. So when we did that divide by zero, the JVM created an instance of this class, the arithmetic exception, and it threw that object. Okay, no one caught it. No one caught that object that was thrown. So the flow of control, when uh, the main method ended, in this case the whole program ended, because the exception happened in the main method, and the error message was printed out on the console. Okay, so there's lots of exceptions defined in the SDK that are runtime exceptions, and there's lots of them that are defined under exception. We're going to talk about the difference between things that are inheriting from runtime exception and the differences and the things that are inherited from exception. We're going to make our own classes that inherit from exception. So those are our custom exceptions. When we have a specific thing we want to look for at runtime, we can um, throw an object of our own creation, and those, those would be inheriting from exception, and they is a throwable, sorry for the English, because exception inherits from throwable. Okay, now, I want us to step back just a little bit. We're going to go back into the code, and we're going to talk about the call stack. So I'll comment out that because we, we need to write some code that will that will work. So I'm going to call a method foo, and we don't have one yet, so we will create one. There it is. There's foo. And inside of foo, I'm going to call a method foo2. And we don't have one yet. So we'll create one. And there's the method foo2. So it doesn't matter what these methods are, or if they're constructors to class constructor methods, or static methods in the math class, or any methods, when you get out of the main, the only way to get out of the main is to call a method. And the way to get out of that method is to call another method. And then when this method is over, what happens? You go back to where you were called from, and then you go back to where you were called from again. So this is not too surprising to you, but I just want us to think about what's going on here. It's called the call stack. So when you, we were in the main, we called the method foo, and then we're executing inside of the method foo. When we called foo2, we're executing inside of the method foo2. So while we're executing lines of code inside of foo2, we have this call stack. A call stack always has main on the bottom in a Java program, because when main is over, the program is over. When foo2 is done executing, what will happen? This box will disappear, and we'll go back and we'll execute on this. So the call stack grows and shrinks depending on the depth of the calls. Let's go back to the code window for a second. So in here, I'm going to declare a variable e and put 45 in it. I don't know why. And I'll just spit out a message that says I'm in foo2. Um, let's go up here and say I'm in foo. I'm in the main. 
So what's gonna happen now? I'm in the main, then I'm in foo, then I'm in foo too. So now down here, what happens if I throw an exception? On this line right here, it's line 24. Okay, so we got kind of the same result that we had before, but now we have a call stack involved. And when we print out the error message, we have the same object that was created. We are, we have um, an arithmetic exception divided by zero. And that happened at foo2, line 24. So we think of it as this line of code through an exception. But you might also think of it as it was this line of code that threw the exception. And you might also think of it as this line of code threw an exception. Do you see what happened? We didn't complete this call. We didn't complete this call. We didn't complete this line of code. So on this line of code, line 24, we went back to where we were called from because the flow of control was interrupted. And from there, we went back to where we were called from because the flow, the flow of control was interrupted. Let's prove that. Okay, we have exactly the same output. We didn't get to any of these lines of code. So the flow of control in the main was interrupted here. We didn't get to do this. We cannot continue executing lines of code when an exception has been thrown. So we, when we come back from foo, we left the main immediately. And we can say the same thing about when we came back from foo too, we left foo. And when this happened, the exception actually happened on this line, we left foo2. So now we have a new way of leaving a method. We usually think of leaving a method by returning to the caller. But now we're going to go back to the caller with an exception. So the exception object that was created, it's an instance of this class. That object was thrown. Nobody caught it, so we went back here. It was thrown from there back to here, and it was thrown from there out of the main, and the program ended. OK, so when an exception occurs, the flow of control is interrupted, and we are not going to continue executing lines of code. We're going to go back up the call stack. Now up and down. <laughs> In the picture I drew with main at the bottom, that would be like going down the call stack. But for whatever reason, we don't say it that way. We say we're going to throw the exception up the call stack. It doesn't matter to me if you say that's up or down, so long as you know what's going on. We're going back to where we were called from. So far, so good. Okay, let's look at our very first try block. So a try block looks like this, and it must have a catch. There's an exception to that.
Oops. Okay, now what has happened? A try block. Think of it as I'm going to try to execute these lines of code inside of the try block. It may or may not work. In this case, it doesn't work. It throws an exception. So if an exception occurs in a try block and the kind of exception matches the catch block, then we're, the flow of control, we will catch the exception and we will kind of, we will recover from the problem. So whatever has gone wrong, we're going to deal with it here and then we're going to allow the flow of control to continue. Let's watch that happen. So we all know now, we're going to switch to the debug perspective, that when an exception occurs, the flow of control is interrupted. I should have cleared that console output. No, I didn't. I didn't want to do that. Okay, now we have a fresh version. This is what's happened so far. We were in the main We called foo. We went into foo. We called foo2. We are in foo2. We are in foo2. And we're going to about, we're about to execute this line of code right here. We're inside of a try block. So let's execute that one line. And we jump to the catch because an exception was thrown and it is of a type that can be caught by this catch block. Now, look at what's happened here. Well, let's, let's step in. When we're in a catch block, think of that as if the code chooses to catch an exception, that means that there's something it can do about it. We didn't really do anything. We just printed out a message saying, I'm dealing with it. And that allows the flow of control to continue. So before, we didn't get here, but this time we do. So we caught the exception, we handled it, and we went on. Before, we didn't get there because it was the foo2 method that generated the uncaught exception, or the unhandled exception. And last time we didn't get here. But this time we caught the exception and we handled it. Let's go back to the Java perspective. Now, what would happen if there was a line of code here? Do you believe that this line will be executed? And it will not. So a try block can be as big as you want. When an exception is thrown, we don't go to the next line. Let's prove it. Did we see what we wanted to see? That went by so quickly. Yes. We did not print out in the try block after to exception. But we did print out, I'm dealing with a problem. OK, so this try catch block caught the exception that was thrown here. So far, so good. I'm going to take that try catch block out.
Now I'm going to put the try catch block up here. Okay, so let's put a breakpoint there and watch what happens in the debugger. Did we not hit that breakpoint? What, what did I do wrong? I'm not seeing it. I'll just run again. There, I hit it that time, that's for sure. Okay, so we're in a try block and we're calling a method and that method will not finish. It will throw an exception. So let's start stepping through this and watch what happens. So we called foo2. We stepped in here and we're executing foo2. We're going to divide by zero or we'll try to. We threw an exception. We did not get here. So the flow of control was interrupted here. We went up the call stack. The code has decided it's going to catch the exception at this level. So we think of it as it's foo2 that threw the exception, the call to foo2. And we handle the exception. That means that there's no more exception outstanding. So look at this little object here, an object of type arithmetic exception. Here it is in the debugger. There's a bunch of information in that little object, including the divide by zero message. Okay, so the exception object was created here. The JVM called new arithmetic exception made an object of that type and threw it. That very object that was thrown here was thrown out of this method and it was caught in this method because that's where the try block is. You might guess that we could have put a try block around this foo, this call to foo. So when you're handling exceptions, you make a decision about where do you want to handle them. You can handle them near where they occur, or you could handle them very, very high up in the call stack. So we do get here this time because the exception was handled. We're going to return normally to the main. We didn't get here the last, the first time. We remember when we didn't have any exception handling at all. Okay, so this is um, handling exceptions that are generated by the JVM, and they handle, they happen all the time. I'm sure that you've all written code that ends with an exception happening, an array index out of bounds exception is a pretty common one when you're learning about dealing with arrays. The flow of control is interrupted and we go up the call stack until someone catches it. If no one catches it, then we're going to eventually leave the main method and the program is over. So when your program ends with an unhandled exception, you get that very um, kind of an ugly way of shutting down the program on the console. It just spits out that all these lines where things went wrong. And one of those lines is the very first thing that went wrong. Okay, look at this try catch. What if I had put catch exception? That catch block 
would catch everything that is a exception. Everything that is a exception. Let's go back here. It would catch everything that is a exception, which is all of these kinds of things that can go wrong. That's not a good practice. You should try to catch the most specific things that you can. Back to the code. Let's change this back to arithmetic exception. And now let's add another catch block. So a single try block can have multiple catch blocks. So there might be several different kinds of things that can go wrong here. You have to be a little bit careful when you're ordering the catch blocks. Suppose I had put them in the opposite order of that I did. The first catch block would catch everything that is a uh, exception, and then the second catch block wouldn't have anything left to do because the exceptions were already handled. Let's demonstrate that. The compiler is smart enough to know that you can't do that. If you catch everything that is a uh, exception first, and then say, OK, now I want to catch arithmetic exceptions, the error message is unreachable catch block. It is already handled by the catch block for exception. Isn't that a clever compiler? It knows that these have to be in order, and the only way you can get them in the right order is to know about the inheritance hierarchy of these objects. There's a lot of them. You won't get to know all of them. But the common ones you will get to know, and the ones that are at the top all of these, this part of the inheritance hierarchy, you must know. Okay, I want us to introduce now the finally block. In C++, this clause, the finally clause, was called and always. I like that better than finally, because it's more descriptive of what it really means. Let's go back to the code where we have the try-catch blocks. So optionally, a try-catch block can have a finally. There's no parameter-like thing in a finally block. The finally block will always happen. So now we have some things that will conditionally happen. So suppose this method runs and there is no exception. Sometimes foo2 will not throw an exception. Let's make that true. OK, now foo2 does not throw an exception anymore. So will we execute this line of code? No, because we didn't catch an arithmetic exception. Will we execute this line of code? No, we didn't find any other kind of an exception. But always will we, we will execute the finally block. So if there's an exception, we'll do a catch block, and we'll do the finally block. If there's no exception, we won't do any catch block, but we will always do the finally block. A use of the finally block might be that if you open a file and you're working with a file open, you want to close that file whether there's an exception or not. So you do things in a finally block that you want to do before you leave whether or not there was an exception. 
put a breakpoint here. Oh, I had a breakpoint there. Okay, so remember that Futu is not going to throw an exception this time. Oh, I had another breakpoint inside of Futu. So we're demonstrating that Futu is executing without throwing any exception. Now, do we execute that catch block? No, nor the second catch block, but we are going to do the finally block. Okay, so throwing and catching exceptions is all about the flow of control. When the flow of control gets interrupted, we're going to go up the call stack until that exception is handled. It's caught and handled. Okay, so far so good. Well, I told you that there was a difference between something that inherits from runtime exception and something that inherits from exception. So the designers of this mechanism decided that there would be a kind of exception that might happen everywhere in any method. Any method might do a, an arithmetic exception. But some exceptions will only happen during specific operations. So a method is defined specifically that it might throw a kind of an exception. Okay, so now we need to understand the throws clause and what the throws clause means. So if a method might throw an exception, there should be a throws clause on the method header, the method signature, unless the exception that it's going to throw is a runtime exception, and then we don't need one. So in all of the cases that we had so far, we've only looked at throwing this kind of an exception, the divide by, sorry, the arithmetic exception, a particular kind of arithmetic exception, which is a divide by zero, that's a runtime exception. So this method can leave through the throws clause that we don't have to put here. <laughs> I'm going to put it there anyway. So throws is a modifier of this method. So this method throws an arithmetic exception. This method was compiling without the throws clause only because arithmetic exception inherits from runtime exception. Can we get that in this pop-up? Okay, here it is. Arithmetic exception inherits from runtime exception, which is a exception, which is a throwable. In fact, Java will put on every method signature throws runtime exception. Anything that is a runtime exception might be thrown from any method. So if we type this throws runtime exception on this method signature, we didn't we didn't gain anything because Java puts it there for us anyway. So all methods might throw a runtime exception. Let's look at the throwing of an exception that isn't in the runtime exception. So I'm going to make an instance of the file reader class. Well, it's not compiling. I'm going to need to import Java IO file reader. Oh, look at this. 
this is not compiling because it throws an exception that we haven't done anything with. So what are our options here? Th these new compilers are, are just so very helpful. There are two quick fixes available. One is add a throws declaration. So we could put throws file not found exception. Well, why don't we let it type it for us? There. And the file not found exception is an I.O. exception, which is a exception, which is a throwable. Notice that it is not a runtime exception. There's no chance you would find, you would throw a file not found exception until you go looking for a file. We went looking for a file called Bob, which isn't there. So it's a good thing we have a way of indicating that this method might throw a file not found exception, because it's going to. Notice that the throws clause allows us to put as many exceptions as we want to that this method might throw. Hmm. Okay, now we've got another compile problem somewhere. Let's save this file because it's the compiler is not quite understanding what's going on right now. So watch what happens when we save this file. Ha! I, I lied. I have to take this out to make this point. We have a catch clause here that would catch all of the exceptions. And I'm going to take that out. Because this is what I wanted to see. <laughs> OK. The foo method compiles because we said we're recognizing that it might throw a file not found exception. But now this line of code doesn't compile. Because it might throw a file not found exception and we don't have a catch block for it. So, when you have a line of code that might throw an exception, you have only two options. You can catch, put it in a try block and catch the exception that it might throw, or you can add a throws clause to the method and say, I want to push the problem up the call stack and let someone else handle it at another level. So in this method, when we couldn't compile this line because this constructor is defined to throw a file not found exception. See, there it is. It throws file not found exception. It doesn't mean it's always going to throw one of those. It means that it has the potential to throw a file not found exception. So we had two choices. Put this method call inside of a try block and catch the file not found exception or indicate that the file not found exception is going up the call stack. So we said let's push it up the call stack. And those disgusting noises in the background are one of my dogs and I don't have time to edit those, those sound effects out so you're just going to have to try not to listen to it. So catch file not found exception FNFE and then do something. You notice that it will compile if we don't put anything in the catch block and that's really frowned upon. It's called eating the exceptions. The reason to catch the exception is so that you at least need to tell someone that something has happened. If you catch it and don't do anything, it's very hard to find the bugs. So let's for now just put in a the 
file not found exception was thrown. I wonder if we run this, it will it will happen. Okay, so we were in foo, we called foo two and before foo two we were in foo, we called foo two, we printed out in foo two. And then the next thing that happened is this threw an exception. We went back to here. It wasn't an arithmetic exception, so we didn't do that line. It was a file not found exception, so we did this line. And then, you know, we're always going to do what's in the finally block. And we continue normally. Once the exception has been caught, it's considered to have been dealt with, and the flow of control can resume. Someone will ask me, how do I ever get back and finish this method? And the answer is you don't. So that one is a little bit difficult to grasp why that makes sense, but for now just understand how the mechanism works. When the exception is thrown, the flow of control is interrupted and we never go to the next line of code. Okay, so we have try, catch, finally, and throws. We never have to include runtime exception in the throws clause. Those are called unchecked exceptions. An unchecked exception because this exception needs to have a throws clause. It's considered to be a checked exception. A checked and an unchecked exception. The throws clause is kind of a nice documentation. So because the file reader constructor had a throws clause, it doesn't take very long to figure out that when something goes wrong, that's what it's going to do. So if you try to open a file that isn't there, you can see by the signature that it it's documented. It's going to throw, or it might throw, a file not found exception. Suppose they had made file not found exception inherit from runtime exception. We wouldn't need this throws clause but the code would be less clear what's going on or what might go on if that file's not found. Okay, so I think we've covered everything that I can think of about exceptions that are thrown by somebody else. We haven't yet looked at how to throw exceptions by ourselves. Just before we leave this slide, I want to make this point once more. If a method might throw a checked exception, like the file not found exception, you have two choices. You catch it there, or you allow it to go up the call stack. If you allow it to go up the call stack, you have to do it explicitly with a throws clause. Okay, so we've done try, catch, and finally. We've done the throws clause, which is always on a method signature. So a throws describes something that a method might do. Never what a class might do. This classes have nothing to do with flow of control, only method calls. Now we've got the throw keyword. The easiest way to think of the throw keyword well, suppose we have an object of type, um, let's see, arithmetic exception. Excuse me. So 
you can make an all your instance an instance of one of these. It's just a regular Java class. The difference is when you have an object that is a uh, throwable, you can throw it. Okay. So what could possibly be wrong with that print line? Think about it. This compiler is pretty smart. If you throw an exception on this line right here, you will not continue to the next line. So this code is unreachable. So this is an unconditional throw. That's pretty unusual. You want to detect something that's gone wrong and then throw the exception in that case. I'm not sure why, but we've decided that if A is greater than B, then we're going to throw an exception. And that allows this code to compile because it might be reachable. It's a conditional throw now. Well, we made this object before we knew we needed it. Let's put it in there. Well, we gave it a name, and we're leaving right here. We didn't need to give it a name. Let's just take that and throw it. OK, so all in one step, we made an object of type arithmetic exception and then we throw the object. So this is an example of throwing an, in, um, an object of arithmetic exception. This is still a, a class that someone else has defined. We haven't defined our own exception classes yet. We're getting close though. Just before I leave this, I want to make a comment about these variable naming conventions. FNFE. Well, I've spent a long time trying to tell you to use correctly spelled English words when you declare variables. In Java, this seems to be a place where you don't have to. So that variable name, FNFE, is only available for a very small period of time only in this block. We didn't even use that variable name for anything. The names for the exceptions usually are the initials of the name of the exception class. So that's an arithmetic exception and that's a file not found exception. That doesn't mean you should change the way that you do all of your variable naming. All of your identifiers except these should be reasonable, readable identifiers. So sometimes what you need to do is to define your own exception class and that will help you throw exceptions that are appropriate to the code that you're working on. And this is really pretty easy. So let's go and make a new class and I'm going to call this um, customer records missing exception. It's like any other class. So for some reason there's a chance that we could have customer records missing and we want to throw an exception. In order to make this something that is a exception, we're going to extend exception. So exception class is in the um, oh I didn't need a main method in there goodness we don't have to import exception it's in Java Lang Java Lang is always imported for you so 
Oddly enough, we could say we're done right now. You can make an instance of this class. And you can throw it, because it's throwable. Exception is a uh, throwable. Let's do something just a little more interesting. Um, no, let's let's do the simplest one first. Public. I don't want to type that too many times. So when we make an instance of this, we're going to pass in a string which describes something about when this happened. And surprise, the parent class, the exception class, has a constructor that takes a message. So this is a fairly common thing to do. Part of the documentation is what exception did we throw? The customer records missing exception. Well, that already tells uh, the programmer something about what's going wrong. And then we can add a message to it. And you might guess that there is a get message and a set message in the parent class. So we get all that for free. Let's go with that one. We could put instance variables in here. And we could make the constructor more elaborate and pass in lots of different things about what's gone wrong. So then when someone makes an instance of this class, the information that's in that object is thrown up the call stack. So it's kind of a new way of passing information around. Information can come out of a method without going out through the return type. It can now go out through the through the throws clause. Let's go do that. In the method foo, wasn't a conditional. I wonder if we can fool it. If 10 is greater than 5. Ah, yeah, okay, we did. It's now a conditional exception. So this code is not unreachable. At least the compiler doesn't know that it's not unreachable. 10 is always going to be greater than 5, so we are always going to throw this exception. But we have um, we have a compile error. Where is it? Oh, we didn't throw. Sorry, sorry. Now we have a compile error. Thank you. Thank you very much. Format the code once in a while. Oh, look. The formatter breaks the lines the way it wants to. Let that happen. That's a fine way of presenting the code. It's just, um, so the, the compiler error is, it's an unhandled exception. So because it's not a runtime exception, we have two choices. We can allow it to go out of this method or we can surround it with a try catch. Well, let's let it go out of the method. So the Eclipse does this for us. It throws a message. Now we have a compiler error up here, the same problem. We threw the exception up to here, and we didn't handle it. So let's handle it up here. Let's try to call foo, and if it doesn't work, we're going to catch. Uh, 
patch. Um, it looks like a parameter, doesn't it? The customer records missing exception. C R M E. And when we catch that object, I want to prove to you that what we're catching is the object that was constructed right here. So I'm going to say crme dot get message. And I'm going to print that out. Okay, let's think about what happens here. We call this method foo. In the method foo, we create an instance of that class, customer records missing exception, and we throw it. So we're leaving this method immediately. We're leaving through the throws clause, not through the return type, through the throws clause. And we're going to come back here. The catch block will execute. And the object that we catch here is the exact object that was constructed here. And we're proving that by printing out the message that was stuffed into the object right here. So far, so good. Let's try and see if that works. Oh, horrible problem. Where did that happen? At line 11. Control forward slash will comment out selected code. Now let's try it again. I'm in foo with an important message. And uh, unable to type correctly, but that don't worry. Okay, so. In the debugger, to convince ourselves that we really know what we're doing, Let's step into the method foo. The first thing that happens is we create this object and we throw it. The flow of control should go where? Back to where the method was called and into the catch block. So here's the object CRME. And whatever object we put, whatever information we put in that has come back from the method foo. Okay, so these are all of the mechanisms for throwing and catching exceptions. The questions that you probably still should have are exactly when should I do this? Exactly what should I what should I throw? Where should I catch things? Designing good code that throws and catches exceptions is a really tough skill to have. Lots of professional programmers don't throw and catch exceptions correctly. There's a lot of discussion, well, argument about what is correct throwing and catching of exceptions. What are good conventions? What are best practices? So it's not easy. What is relatively easy is understanding exactly what the mechanism in the language does. And that's where we need to get to today. So try, catch, finally, maybe multiple catch blocks. Throws clauses. If you want a exception to leave the method that isn't a runtime exception, you need a throws clause. The object that you catch is the object that was constructed and thrown.
these are the new keywords. I think you're ready to go and work on some um, practice exercises with throwing and catching exceptions. I'll see you next time.